Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session about uh, OpenStack networking with Neutron. Uh, it's going to be kind of a bird's eye view. Uh, it's much too less time to um, try to dig deep into all the components and uh, how they work and so on, but I'm going to try to give you a feel of what the different components do and, uh, and how you can use them and to kind of spur your interest to, for uh, uh, to find more information about the different components and so on. Who am I? Uh, I'm Unix Network Geek uh, for 20 plus years. I've been playing with OpenStack for around three years. Uh, and right now doing DevOpsy stuff for uh, a public uh, and private cloud provider. And I've been doing that for quite some time, and I still have fun, have fun doing it. Just a very few words about uh, the service that I daily work with, just so you get a feel where, where I'm coming from. Uh, as I said, it's a public uh, OpenStack cloud, uh, classic infrastructure as a service, uh, multiple sites in different countries, 10 gigabit connections between sites, and mostly built on, open, on standard OpenStack components. We try to keep uh, vendor neutral and uh, try to keep away from um, too much uh, vendor lock-in uh, products. Uh, the thing we do is that we develop our own control panel, mostly to integrate with our other services and so on. And on the technical side, uh, it's OpenStack. It's uh, currently mostly Metaka release, a few liberties still around. Uh, it's standard Neutron, ML2 OpenV switch, kind of a reference, uh, reference implementation. Uh, we're doing uh, dedicated network nodes instead of uh, uh, DVR. I'm going to get in more into that later on. Uh, we do layer three high availability uh, to prevent uh, single network node going down uh, affecting customer networks. Uh, uses VXLAN for overlay networking and uh, some other services like load balancers, service and VPN as a service and so on. Uh, what is Neutron? Um, the OpenStack documentation basically says that Neutron is an OpenStack project to provide network connectivity as a service um, between interface devices, virtual NICs, managed by other uh, OpenStack services, for example, Nova and it implements the Neutron API. That's basically what, what Neutron is, according to the source itself. A few words about the history of Neutron. Uh, historically, uh, networking in OpenStack was uh, handled by uh, Nova Network. Uh, in Folsom, uh, something called Quantum was released, uh, and basically, uh, uh, of, after uh, uh, a few years in Havana, uh, after a while in Havana, rather, it was renamed Neutron due to a uh, trademark mark dispute of some kind. Uh, also in Havana, uh, the initial monolithic uh, Linux bridge and the OpenV switch uh, was replaced by um, uh, ML2, uh, modular day 2 uh, plugins. And uh, those uh, monolithic drivers were replaced by uh, uh, mechanism drivers, so-called mechanism drivers. And the thing about that was uh, to make it easier to implement new layer 2 uh, uh, types without having to rewrite uh, the whole plugins. Uh, there are some basic parts of uh, OpenStack networking. Uh, maybe the most basic are networks and subnets. And the networks are basically uh, layer two broadcast domains. It's um, kind of like a physical network uh, or a VLAN or something like that in the, uh, if you compare it to the physical world. And then the subnet, uh, it's basically a layer three object. It can be of IPv4 or IPv6 types. Uh, 
it's, uh, you can connect one or more uh, subnets to one network, and uh, it contains also information about uh, network uh, configuration like the sitter and the uh, IP address allocation pools and the name servers and so on. Uh, some networking t terminology in uh, OpenStack. Uh, you talk about something called provider networks, and uh, those are created by the administrator, and uh, the reason for that is that it maps to physical networks, and uh, it's uh, hopefully the administrator has uh, the knowledge to, uh, uh, about the underlying physical network so they can configure it, while a user probably doesn't have, uh, have that uh, information. Uh, and it can map to different kinds of physical networks. It could be uh, just a normal uh, uh, network, or it could be a VLAN, or it uh, could be other types of networks. Uh, a tenant network, on the other hand, is created by the user, and the user can create them uh, uh, by themselves, and they pick their own, usually pick their own uh, IP addresses and can uh, set the configuration on the network itself. It's an isolated network just uh, within the project. And it can be used for virtual machines to, to talk to each other. And you can connect it to other things uh, through routers. I'm going to get more into that as well a bit later. Uh, when we come to different network types, um, there are local networks which are basically only used for single box testing, uh, not, in, not in production. But, but the more interesting is uh, flat net networking, where all instances share the same network, no segregation. It's just a single network, no VLANs, no, nothing like that. Uh, you could, you could uh, it doesn't have any knowledge of VLANs. You could connect it uh, theoretically to a VLAN uh, through a bridge or something like that, of course. Uh, then you have the VLANs, uh, VLAN type of networks. Uh, they are separated by VLAN tags. And um, uh, you can like, configure OpenStack to, uh, uh, with the segmentation ID to, to connect it to different, uh, different VLANs depending on uh, the segmentation ID if you have a VLAN trunk to, uh, to the um, uh, network node. Uh, then you have uh, GRE networks. I'm going to get a little bit more into uh, GRE and VXLAN uh, later on, but basically they are uh, tunnel networks, uh, overlay networks that are used for uh, communications between, um, between, between uh, uh, virtual machines on different network nodes. Another basic uh, part of uh, the OpenStack network architecture is uh, ports. Uh, it's basically a connection of a network interface to a network. And you can use it to connect uh, many different things to, to the network. It could be a virtual machine. It could be a DHCP server, a router. It could also be uh, some kind of load balancer as a service uh, instance, or things like that. It also contains some network configuration information, uh, like MAC address and the IP address of the port. Uh, then you have the router component. Those are virtual instances uh, that route traffic between different networks. And uh, of course that is used to, uh, to uh, route between different subnets that are not uh, in the same uh, broadcast domain, just like a normal router. Uh, you can route between uh, tenant networks. Uh, and you could, of course, uh, route between uh, tenant networks and provider networks, and also, in that case, uh, provide the, the NAT that is usually uh, required to, um, uh, to get to the right IP address uh, translation between uh, the private networks, uh, the internal networks, and, uh, and provider networks. Uh, there are also something called uh, HA routers, high availability. It a basically adds high availability to the router concept. And uh, 
it's a, a standard VRR, VRR, VRRP instance that uh, will uh, be in active passive mode normally, and if the active one goes down, it will uh, switch over to the passive one. Of course, to uh, prevent a single network node going down from uh, affecting your customer networks and, uh, and so on. In our test, it usually take like eight, 10 seconds or something like that to switch over. You can probably tune that a bit if you want to. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and it basically makes the router live in different, in uh, more than one network node. Uh, there's also uh, something called the uh, DVR, Distributed Virtual Routing. And that's a way to um, distribute routing uh, and uh, make it happen on the compute nodes instead of network nodes. And it's basically um, uh, done to uh, have another way of scaling, uh, scaling uh, your network, uh, uh, the handling of the network. Uh, either you can uh, have them scale independently, you scale network nodes and uh, compute nodes uh, individually, or you uh, uh, scale compute nodes and uh, they also handle uh, the networking. In some ways you have, still have to do some, um, some uh, in some architectures you have to do some uh, natting on, um, on a network node even though you're uh, using DVR. Okay, uh, a little bit further down in the uh, uh, OpenStack network uh, architecture, you have the agent, uh, agents that uh, kind of make uh, those things we talked about earlier happen and uh, realizes the routers and uh, networks and subnets and so on. And begin, we can begin with the L2 agent, uh, which in this case I'm going to talk about the Open vSwitch agent. There are other, other agents that can use, use other technologies as well. Uh, and it basically handles provisioning of uh, the layer two networks and connectivity for uh, the virtual machines. Um, it communicates with Open vSwitch, provisioning all this and uh, basically configuring uh, Open vSwitch to uh, do everything you have configured uh, uh, the, the, the network, uh, the configuration you have done in, in OpenStack through the APIs, of course. And uh, you provision, it also provisions uh, security group IP tables uh, to um, realize them. And it also handles uh, the overlay networking that we talked a little bit about earlier and we'll get into a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. Uh, as I said, it communicates with something called the Open vSwitch. And Open vSwitch is uh, basically a virt vir uh, virtual switch. Uh, it's not in itself an OpenStack component. It's uh, more of a generic component that uh, OpenStack uses. And it's a generic virtual switch. You could use it for other, uh, other uh, usages as well. Uh, it handles the L2 uh, connectivity and um, basically works like a normal uh, physical switch and has uh, support for lots of the same protocols and uh, stuff like NetFlow and so on, but only a subset of those, um, uh, um, what it supports is used in, um, in OpenStack. Uh, it basically consists of uh, three components. Um, you have a kernel module that, consists, uh, that uh, makes the data plane and where, where the magic kind of happens. And then you have a vSwitch daemon that uh, handles the uh, configuration programming of the kernel module and inserts the configuration you want to and uh, make the kernel module do what you want it to do. Uh, then you have the OVS database, which is uh, basically a configuration database. It has um, uh, all the configuration uh, stored that, uh, that is needed for, um, for the open vSwitch to work. Uh, speaking about uh, overlay networking, uh, OpenStack support uh, mainly of VXLAN and GRE. And those are the most commonly used. Uh, those are basically tunnel protocols that uh, encapsulates uh, the IP packets in, uh, uh, in another packet, basically. And 
it's used to uh, be able to uh, forward traffic between uh, between uh, compute nodes. Uh, if you have a virtual machine on one compute node and another on the other one, and they want to communicate independently of um, of the uh, physical network and uh, how that looks, you you just tunnel it. As long as there is IP connectivity, you can set up such a tunnel. And uh, it will also uh, separate the different uh, uh, networks that might exist on on the network on the um, uh, compute nodes. Also, it encapsulates traffic uh, going to um, uh, to the network nodes and uh, and uh, going out to, uh, that that is supposed to go out uh, for, for, to um, an external network or something like that. Uh, and that's of course a good thing that you don't have to uh, uh, do any reconfiguration of the underlying network uh, when you provision new networks, and uh, it's an easy way to accomplish that without having to uh, have a, a special vendor uh, uh, modules to to uh, actually configure the network all the time when you provision stuff. Uh, Security groups are basically uh, IP table rules that are implemented on, uh, uh, by the L2 agent on uh, the compute nodes, very close, close to the uh, uh, virtual machine. And it uh, basically filters traffic. Uh, it limits uh, what, may, uh, go in and what traffic may go in and out on the interfaces on the virtual machine. Uh, there do exist other implementations, not only the IP tables uh, implementation. There is, for example, an uh, OVS, uh, Open vSwitch, that is, uh, flow-based implementation. And uh, the really good thing about that one is that uh, it has much better performance than the IP tables uh, uh, one. Uh, also, there is a little esoteric thing about it that when you do IP tables, you have to uh, 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 flow the traffic between uh, through a bridge, a Linux bridge, and uh, with the OBS flow imp uh, flow based implementation, you don't have to do that, and that also helps helps uh, performance. Uh, then we have the L3 agent, and uh, as you can probably guess, it handles L3 uh, the L3 uh, provisioning. And it provisions routers. It sets up namespaces and um, everything around that. I'm going to get into what namespaces are in a few moments. And um, it handles uh, NAT provisioning and also flo and fl the floating IPs, which uh, utilizes uh, NAT to, uh, to work. Uh, Network namespaces. Uh, those, this is basically a Linux function that creates multiple instances uh, of parts of the IP stack. And it's uh, there to be able to uh, separate different, uh, different routers from each other as you need to, um, uh, as, as the customers create the tenant networks, uh, it might be overlapping network IP spaces. Uh, two customers can easily pick the same um, uh, same IP network, especially as it's uh, private net private networks with private IP addresses. Uh, so it wouldn't work if it was in the same instance. Uh, each namespace has its own routing table and IP tables, to, um, and that's how the separation works. And there are lots of uh, different demons in uh, in uh, the OpenStack network architecture that. Um, that uh, runs in different namespaces. You have DHCP servers, uh, metadata proxies, and uh, also the different services if you're, if you're running uh, VPN as a service or load balancer as a service and so on. And the floating IPs? Uh, publicly uh, Routable IP addresses are, of course, uh, IPv4 addresses are, of course, a scarce resource nowadays. Uh, it's getting less and less easy to uh, to get any new addresses and uh, more and more costly. 
Uh, and that was why basically the, one of the main points behind uh, the floating IP address function. Uh, floating IP is, basi is basically based on uh, NAT. And uh, instead of NAT, IPv6 is of course the way to go, but I guess we still need some uh, IPv4 addressing uh, uh, for a while longer. Um, when it comes to IPv4, uh, you don't want to provision uh, the tenant networks with public uh, IPv4 addresses for this reason. And instead, uh, use private addresses inside, uh, inside uh, the private networks. And instead, you have uh, uh, private RFC 1918 ad ad addresses uh, there. And then you connect the floating IPs to the instances where you need it. And this is realized uh, by the L3 agent on uh, the network nodes or in, uh, partly in, uh, in the compute nodes if you use DVR. And it will basically take care of uh, natting, uh, doing the ne network address translation between uh, the internal addresses uh, of the tenant network and the addresses of the provider network. Uh, over to a bit uh, about IPv6. There is extensive support in, um, in OpenStack for IPv6. Not every feature uh, is there. And there, is no, there are no floating IPs, and this is, uh, it's probably not supposed to be any um, anytime soon, soon either, probably not at all, as it's uh, expected that you're using uh, global IPv6 addresses for uh, the tenant networks and have no overlap. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more um, later on, how that works when, uh, when I said earlier that uh, you usually uh, set your own IP addresses uh, uh, for the tenant networks. Uh, you have support both for uh, uh, state, stateless address auto configuration, uh, Slack, and uh, that is uh, a way for um, the virtual machines to uh, obtain the IP addresses and they get to know which IP addresses uh, they're going to use uh, without using, uh, necessarily using DHCP. But you can also use the DHCP v6. And there are a couple of uh, issues there when uh, only using uh, SLAAC you don't um, normally get any DNS addresses, uh, DNS um, uh, information, for example. But there are two kinds of uh, DHCP v6 um, uh, flavors, one that is uh, stateless and one stateful. And uh, the stateless basically, uh, then you basically get your address from, uh, with the um, uh, stateless uh, address auto configuration. And then you get the DNS information from and other information from the DHCP v6 uh, service. Uh, when it comes to uh, DHCP v6 uh, stateful, it's pretty much like uh, an ordinary DHCP server for, uh, for IPv4. Not very much of a difference. Uh, you also have support for prefix delegation, which means that you can, uh, can provide uh, whole prefixes, network prefixes to, um, uh, to uh, networks in, uh, in OpenStack, not just uh, specific addresses. Okay, the D DHCP addresses, uh, the DHCP agents, uh, those are basically, uh, they, they handle provisioning of DHCP for uh, the tenant networks. Uh, and uh, they realize this by using DNS mask uh, to provide the DHCP service. And it does that, of course, within uh, the specific namespaces to be able to, for uh, the virtual machines to um, request IP addresses. Uh, it also handles uh, RADVD for IPv6, which is uh, needed for um, uh, Slack that we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, then we have uh, metadata agents. Uh, a couple of different uh, agents that are used there, a couple of different demons. Uh, metadata is uh, basically called, uh, used to provide cloud init and user data information for the virtual machines. And these are basically uh, configuration details. Uh, it could, for example, be uh, the public and private IP addresses of an instance. It can be uh, 
Um, even you can even insert uh, through user data specific scripts and uh, stuff that is supposed to run on the virtual machine when it's started and so on. So it's both a way for, uh, for you to push information and push um, um, things uh, that you want uh, the virtual machine to do on startup. It could be, for example, to uh, provision it as a puppet, uh, puppet client or do some Ansible stuff on it or whatever. And it's also a way for the, uh, uh, for the cloud in a daemon in, uh, in uh, the virtual machine to be able to get some information about the environment it uh, lives in, like uh, stuff like host name, um, IP addresses, and so on. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, there is also uh, there is a, the metadata proxy that is uh, run. Um, uh, there, first of all, there is an IP table rule uh, in the router namespace that redirects uh, a specific address. Uh, basically, I, I forgot to say that um, the um, cloud in it. Uh, it works by uh, the daemon asking basically for a URL for a specific IP address and a specific URL and it gets a response back for the different uh, kinds of information you might need. Uh, and the IP table rule in the router namespace uh, redirects that request uh, to a proxy, the metadata proxy, which in, the case, in, the, in this case uh, rewrites the request, uh, adds some more information to it, exam for example, which uh, which router namespace it's uh, belonging to and some stuff about that to be able to for the metadata agent uh, that it then uh, uh, forwards the request to and uh, enables the metadata agent to actually know which, which virtual machine has uh, asked the question. And then the metadata agent will uh, respond with, uh, with uh, an answer to a request and uh, give the virtual machine the data that it needs. There are also some other uh, services that uh, you can use um, and provide for, uh, for the um, users of, uh, of uh, your OpenStack installation. One of those is uh, Load Balancer as a service. Uh, and uh, there are two versions, version 1 and version 2. And there are a number of limitations with uh, version 1. For example, you don't have uh, TLS termination, uh, you can uh, only listen, and, and, and kind of the main one is that you can only listen to one port on each load balancer IP, which means that uh, you have to pick uh, if you want to answer uh, port 80 or port 443 for, uh, for a web, web server, which pretty much, uh, for many, many use cases, it's uh, pretty hard to use it in a useful way. Uh, load balancer as a service version 2 uh, is a lot better, uh, lots of more um, uh, configuration possibilities and uh, it uh, solves those problems I mentioned here and other problems as well. Uh, one problem there though is that there is no clear migration path. Uh, the, thing, uh, the main recommendation is basically to remove all that load balancers and uh, then recreate them in, uh, as uh, V2 load, load balancers, which can, of course, be a pain if you have lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, load balancer already deployed. Uh, in the reference implementation, uh, load balancers are in, uh, as a service, implements uh, the load balancers with the HA proxy. And, um, well, sets up an HA proxy in the right namespace and uh, just goes away with it. Uh, then you have this, uh, the VPN as a service. Uh, it's a way to connect uh, tenant networks uh, through IPsec tunnels uh, to uh, other networks. Those other networks could either be another OpenStack, uh, a network in another OpenStack um, region or installation. Uh, or it could be uh, uh, just a tunnel back to your office or another data center or and anything basically that can speak, uh, speak IPsec. Uh, there are several backends. Uh, there are some commercial backends for, uh, for proprietary uh, network solutions and there are also uh, free ones like LibreSwan and uh, StrongSwan. Uh, 
It's used by configuring it in, in a little other way. The load balancer is a service, as we talked about earlier. It has its, uh, its own agent that you start if you want to um, uh, use load balancer as a service. Uh, VPN as a service, on the other hand, doesn't have any, uh, its own uh, separate daemon. It's rather that you, instead of using the L3 daemon that you normally use uh, to do all the L3 stuff, you uh, instead start the OpenStack VPN agent, which does both the L3 stuff and the VPN as a service uh, stuff. Uh, firewall as a service is another uh, interesting uh, service. Uh, it's perimeter security uh, that it can help you with. Uh, the difference between uh, security groups and firewalls as a service is basically that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, security groups are uh, implemented right next to um, the virtual machine and uh, prevents traffic from entering. It's almost like a host, uh, host firewall. It's uh, only used basically for one virtual machine. While the firewall as a service is um, uh, rather like, more like a traditional firewall that uh, you implement that at the router levels, and you can uh, use it to, uh, to uh, limit traffic between networks. And uh, those are applied with, um, uh, in the standard, impl in standard implementation with the IP tables and are applied on the network node. Uh, another interesting feature uh, are subnet pools and address scopes. And uh, this uh, is about what I talked about earlier, that you have, might have uh, the thing that you want to use um, IP addresses that are um, globally routable on the, even on the tenant networks, especially with um, IPv6. In that case, uh, you can uh, set up uh, subnet pools, with, which um, yeah, basically makes you be able to pick uh, a network from a pool that has been uh, defined by the administrator when, you create, uh, when the user creates subnets. And of course, this is especially important for networks with uh, public IP addresses. Uh, it could also be useful if you have uh, a strict uh, IP policy within a company, for example, and you, you want it to be uh, routable within the company, even if it's uh, private addresses that are used. So it's usable both with IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, combined with address scopes, that is a very, uh, very powerful thing. As, uh, with address scope, you can control which uh, address spaces on the tenant networks need to be routed uh, or, and which uh, needs to be uh, natted to be able to uh, reach a provider network or external network. Uh, that combined with uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, Neutron can act as a BGP speaker is also very powerful as you can, um, you can actually have uh, Neutron announce the networks that, uh, that you have provided to the tenant networks uh, to any other equipment that, uh, that can speak BGP in your network. And you basically announce uh, the tenant prefixes and uh, host routes for floating IPs, uh, whichever and, or both. And some, some, uh, guy, uh, some uh, links to some further learning when you can get more into detail in all those uh, components. And I would recommend the networking guides and uh, the admin guide, of course. Uh, there are lots of details there. And there are also a very good source of um, information is um, uh, summit presentations. Uh, never mind which uh, topic or subject you're uh, mostly interested in. You can uh, definitely find more information if you search for uh, summit presentations to watch about it. Um, keep in mind though that it's uh, pretty important to try to keep to the more recent presentations as uh, things move really fast, fast in, uh, in uh, Neutron as in uh, the rest of OpenStack. So things uh, quickly can get outdated and you miss uh, critical features and so on. Okay, we have a few minutes for uh, questions as well. That's, that's what. Um, 
let's see, so you talked about the, uh, the subnet pools and also on a previous slide you mentioned uh, prefix delegation. Uh, is there some relationship between those two things that are going on? And if so, could you kind of discuss how, you know, how it works? Uh, yeah, you can use prefix delegation. Uh, it, ha it has that association, but you can also use um, uh, set up kind of internal pools without doing, uh, doing uh, prefix delegation in that case. And it works both for IPv4 and IPv6, so it's not just uh, for IPv6 as well. Okay, so if you were using prefix delegation, would that get like, uh, would that manifest itself as uh, subnet pools, or are they two separate concepts? Uh, there are two separate concepts. Okay. Thanks. Question there? Thanks. Uh, your uh, IP net function for IPv4, is that uh, balanced? In, in high availability, so in the event of a, a, a state control, will it then uh, be able to fail over without disconnecting the connectivity? Uh, did I understand the cor uh, question correct, that it's, uh, if, if you're using high availability routers, if you can switch over to, uh, to another node? In that yeah, case. so yes. if you're doing an overlay netting in between the overlay to the outbound, so from, from an overlay in the virtual, in the hypervisor to the, uh, to the external IP net? Yes, yes it can. Uh, the router is actually moved from, uh, from one, uh, or rather activated on uh, the other network node. And uh, that makes, uh, well, that moves all the functionality of the router that is uh, used for connectivity between uh, between the um, external network, as long, of course, as both ne both uh, network node has the same um, uh, access to networks and so of on, course. physical. Yeah. Uh, what about the V2 of uh, the balancer? Sorry. The V2 version of the balancer will that do the same or be able to do the same? Uh, yes, it's it's also. Wait a second. I'm I'm not actually sure if the V2 load balancer is moved with it. Let me think for a moment. Or we I, can take it later. Yeah, we, we can discuss it later. Thanks. I'm not, not quite sure. Okay. A few years ago, I know that the, that the performance and stability of these uh, routers uh, that is included in OpenStack were not so good. What is your view of them today? What, what's the kind of performance in packets, uh, routing per second? Well, that depends, of course, on the hardware. It depends on uh, things like the, what network interface cards you have. Uh, there are some um, uh, technologies to uh, actually offload, for example, some uh, of the VXLAN parts to network interfaces, and that can do miracles with performance. So, I mean, it's a really hard question to, to answer, uh, kind of an exact number of uh, packets per second. but. Uh, with the right configuration, I've seen uh, networks uh, basically reach uh, pretty much line speed, at least, when it comes to uh, Neutron. Also, there have, there have been lots of uh, modifications of uh, Neutron uh, lately that has uh, been focused on, uh, on uh, performance and also those thing, things that you, for example, be able to um, uh, use the OVS uh, plugins for, uh, for firewalling with help uh, performance as well, as you don't have to go through the bridge that I talked, to, talked about uh, earlier. But uh, it's a hard question to ask, and you probably have to uh, really think about the architecture and how you, what hardware you use and uh, so on to, um, to be able to, um, to answer that question as it varies widely. I actually saw a presentation yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, that I can recommend about uh, Neutron and uh, its performance and uh, some testing they had done on it and ben benchmarking. That would probably be useful for you to watch. Thank you. We have a few seconds more, so I, I think it's the last question. Okay, thanks for the overview. It was very useful for me. So I have a question about provider networks right from the beginning of your talk. Yep. So, uh, you mentioned it, it can only be created by admins. Is, is that something that 
can be changed with the roles mechanism? And have you looked at it? Yeah, you could probably change it uh, with the roles mechanism. Um, of course, that depends on your use case, uh, what kind of users you have. But uh, you could probably change it and, uh, and have um, a user be able to create uh, provider networks. Um, and yeah, I can see that could be useful in, in some, some places when uh, if basically the users are uh, network engineers and have the knowledge of uh, the underlying network to be able to do that. Thanks. Welcome. Okay.